The IMF warns Barbados will sink deeper into debt without further spending cuts. That's our top story in Caribbean Newsline for Thursday, November 23. From the CMC News Centre in Bridgetown, I'm Nicole Best. Good evening. The International Monetary Fund is not convinced Barbados is doing enough to fix its debt problem. And after conducting an Article 4 consultation, which ended on Thursday, the head of that IMF mission is advising the Frandel Stewart administration to cut its spending further. Judith Gold said the IMF is not optimistic about government meeting its fiscal target as set out in what she describes as an ambitious budget of May 2017. The IMF has forecast that the government was likely to fall short of its overall targets, even with the substantial hike in the National Social Responsibility Levy from 2 to 10 percent, an introduction of a new sales tax on foreign currency transactions and a hike in the excise duty on fuel. It also warned that the country's international reserves, which stood well below the 12-week benchmark at just 8.6 weeks of import cover, are likely to dip even further by year-end. Against this backdrop, the IMF advised that substantial further fiscal effort is needed to decisively place the debt on a downward trajectory. The IMF is recommending that government's adjustment strategy focus on addressing the high transfers, containing other current expenditures, and maintaining a strong revenue effort. It also suggested urgent structural reforms to support growth and improve the business climate for domestic and foreign investment. And the fund is willing to help. It says it stands ready to assist the government, including through continued policy dialogue and technical assistance. Staying on the economic front, the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Timothy Antoine, says Grenada must continue with its fiscal responsibility policies regardless of which party wins the upcoming general elections. Elections are constitutionally due in Grenada within the first half of next year, and the main political parties have begun oiling their election machinery. Antoine told CMC News he held talks with earlier this month with Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell and members of his cabinet, as well as the leadership of the main opposition National Democratic Congress on the issue of economic growth and fiscal responsibility. Whoever wins the next election in Grenada, um, fiscal responsibility is going to be important. Whoever wins the next election has to get on with the issue of structural reforms. To transform, we have to reform. And the pace of reform is to pick up in the Caribbean. Grenada included. So those are simple messages. Uh, the specifics, obviously, as a central bank, we can advise at the right time. But uh, it is very clear, Grenada has to stay the course in terms of what it has done. Grenada is emerging from a 19.4 million U.S. dollar IMF-supported extended credit facility that was approved in 2014. Antoine said the transparency that has been developed over the life of the homegrown program must continue. He also said there is a need for public sector modernization and there are specific things the country has to do with respect to the labor market. The key part of how we address the employment issue, especially amongst our youth, that is a major issue that has to be addressed. How we deal with agriculture uh, is an important issue. How we deal with uh, the question of tourism, uh, medical education, medical tourism, those are areas that must be looked at. Um, clearly, there are a number of things we have to do with public sector modernization, because that is how you also have to address the issue of growth in the economy. Those are not new issues. I think all the parties know these, what these issues are. The Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago says there are no plans to devalue the local currency. 
but it warns the country will need to maintain the dynamism of its monetary policy to deal with current as well as future domestic and external financial challenges. There have been calls from the private sector economists and financial experts for Trinidad and Tobago to devalue its dollar in light of the tight foreign exchange situation as well as the drastic decline in revenue from the energy sector which has resulted in economic problems for the Twin Island Republic. But CBTT Governor Dr. Alvin Hilaire told a news conference that the country has enough foreign exchange to cover at least nine months of imports. Uh, uh, you would have seen different reports, and um, I think it could in the latest IMF report. And the arguments for, for um, changing rates and so forth do have merit. Now, let me, let me go back and forgive me if it seems theoretical, but let me go back to the point I made about combination of policies and what could work and what may not work and so forth. Basically, any regime could work if you have the rest of the conditions supportive of them. Hiller said the financial institution is joining other central banks across the globe in pursuing a monetary policy appropriate to country-specific circumstances while advocating for closer coordination with other macroeconomic policies and avoiding excessive money creation. 9.8 months. In terms of, of, of whether it would, it would improve, well, on the present trajectory, it might actually weaken for a while because if we have our intervention, what intervention meaning we spend, uh, or the central bank intervenes bi-weekly. We've done it at a rhythm of about uh, 150 US per, per month. With the current state of oil markets, we could have a further decline in reserves towards the end of this year. And especially if we have to increase intervention because of the seasonal Christmas uh, things. So I would say in the next few months, we might have a, a further slipping in reserves. Still in Trinidad and Tobago, a criminal court specifically to hear cases involving children is to be set up by the end of the year. That announcement was made by Acting Superintendent Beverly Rodriguez of the Children Protection Unit. She says the court would operate differently with a focus on preventing children from growing into career criminals. We would be removing the punitive aspect of dealing with children and going to a more restorative justice system where these children will be peer counseled mm -hmm. and we will even try to, to, to deal with them in most instances in a preventative manner. In Jamaica, the Office of the Contractor General, the OCG, has recommended that police and the Director of Public Prosecutions investigate the awarding of contracts by the constituency office of an opposition MP. The OCG said the probe should be conducted into a possible conspiracy to defraud the government by St. Anne's Southeast Member of Parliament Lisa Hanna, the St. Anne's Municipal Corporation and several contractors. We get more in this report from Anthony Luggs of TVJ News. The investigation into the awarding of contracts by the St. Anne Municipal Corporation and Member of Parliament for Southeast St. Anne, Lisa Hanna, began in 2015. Fast forward to 2017. After two years of investigations, Contractor General Dirk Harrison has referred the case to the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP. But why? In the report, the OCG recommended that the authorities investigate whether the decision of Ms. Hanna to propose the awarding of contracts to 12 persons affiliated or associated with the People's National Party, PNP, gives rise to a conflict of interest. The OCG wants the probe to determine whether Ms. Hanna willfully neglected the performance of her duty and misconducted herself by making recommendations for the award of government contracts and if this amounted to an abuse of the public's trust by acting fraudulently. The report names several persons and also recommends that all councillors in the St. Anne Municipal Corporation be investigated following allegations of the receipt of monies from contractors and facilitators who received contracts. He has also recommended that a criminal investigation be conducted to determine whether well-known businessman Richard Lake, a close associate of Ms. Hanna, interfered or committed an act of obstruction during the course of its investigation. 
The contractor general alleged that Mr. Lake persuaded a woman identified as Joan MacDonald to make a false statement and to mislead his office. Mr. Harrison has also recommended that a criminal investigation be conducted in all 53 contracts awarded by the constituency office and the municipal corporation. Meantime, attorney K.D. Knight, who is representing Hannah, has dismissed the allegations. He said on Wednesday that having reviewed the report, the legal team had found no criminal culpability on Hannah's part. Based on the conclusions and recommendations made by the OCG's office, I have gone very carefully through those, line by line, word by word, and um, I see no criminal wrongdoing. Basically, for police officers to go to 554 pages and then launch in a criminal investigation, I think is a waste of the time of the police. And for the officers, the DPP, to actually read through 554 pages, combing to see if there is any offense committed by anyone, it is a grand waste of time. However, JLP affiliate group Generation 2000 believes Hannah should step aside as MP following the release of the Contractor General's report. It said the report brings her political office, members of the constituency executive, and herself into disrepute. The group believes the case should also be referred to the major organized crime and anti-corruption agency for investigation. Coming up in Caribbean Newsline, Dominica could have its first case of hantavirus. We'll have that story and more after the break. Stay with us. Come, sail with us through our ocean blues, where there's a blessed land that's waiting for you. Shh, look, look listen, listen, feel, feel. Realize your dream escape that's magically surreal. The best kept secret. A place you'll never forget, where adventure beckons with every gentle footstep. From lush mountain green to warm volcanic sand, submerged in splendor, our 32 enchanting islands. A kaleidoscope of experiences. No need to look anymore. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. On the road, facing the Boston Celtics, there's Steph Curry back after missing one game. Where's Kyrie, though? He got the mask on. He's ready to go. Two best teams in the NBA. We all know about Boston's defense. They're ranked number one in the NBA, and they show right here early on. Jalen Brown gets the steal, puts on a show. 22.7 rebounds in the game for number seven in your program. Very impressive. Jam. Puts the Celtics to within three. Health authorities in Dominica are awaiting confirmation of a preliminary test to determine whether the hurricane-battered island has registered its first case of the unusual hunter virus, which is spread by rodents. A statement by the Minister of Health and Environment said that confirmatory tests are being done at the Center for Disease Control in the United States. So far, an epidemiological investigation has not found further cases on the island. Hunter virus is spread similar to leptospirosis. Rodents shed the virus in their urine, droppings, and saliva, and any contact with any of those can put people at risk for infection. The Ministry of Health has therefore advised residents to practice good hygiene and report rat infestation to the Environmental Health Office. 
on the heels of allegations of misconduct by a male teacher at a leading secondary school in Guyana. Education Minister Nicolette Henry says there is need to improve awareness about sexual misconduct in school. Henry said she is to be briefed by the Chief Education Officer Marcel Hudson about the incident and she committed to making public the findings of the investigation into the allegations which were first reported by Cultural Policy Advisor at the Ministry of Education, Ruel Johnson. Henry said the scandal which has garnered national interest has also raised the need for awareness about sexual misconduct and harassment in schools, particularly among school children. The allegation made against the teacher has prompted several human rights groups to stage a protest at the secondary school he's attached to, calling for his removal. We get more in this HGP nightly news report. Predators do not protect predators. Do not protect predators. Several former female students of one of the country's most prestigious high schools, Bishop High, and other former female students of secondary schools in the city have publicly accused the serving male teacher of sexual misconduct. The young ladies have resorted to social media to share their experiences of the teacher groomed them until they reached the legal age of consent, then approached them for oral sex, penetrative sex, and other forms of intercourse. The allegations made the spotlight when cultural policy advisor at the Ministry of Social Cohesion, Ruel Johnson, first took to social media to raise the issue of the inappropriate behavior of the teacher. Johnson also told of how some of the students stepped forward and confided in him, providing information which he is willing to share. The allegations sparked a protest at the Bishop High School Tuesday, where the Women and Gender Equality Commission and several other rights groups demanded the sacking of the teacher. When you are in a position of trust, it's not to harm the child, it's to help the child. But here it is, we have a serial pedophile, a serial rapist, who used his, who abused his position of trust. And then we have a system that is supporting it. Nicole Cole of the Women and Gender Equality Commission, she is on fire in search of an end to any form of abuse of female students. We need for the abuse to stop. We need for the teachers to believe. We need for them to protect. We need for them to stop the victim blaming and victim shaming. And we need to have a society whereby we feel that our children will not be preyed upon by their own teacher. The head teacher of the Bishop's High School also came under fire after she reportedly called out female students at an assembly on Monday and accosted them for their behavior. Whatever the case is, or whoever is offering cover for deviants, the rights groups are in arms over the developments. We must protect our children. We must do better as a nation. We cannot condone child sexual abuse in our society. It must stop. If it's happening in the schools, it must stop. If it's happening in the churches, if the Pope, the Bishop, the Imam, the Pandit, whoever is doing it. Several government ministries and the chief education officer have been made aware of the matter. And ahead in Newsline Sport, West Indies captain, wary of powerful New Zealand, but still hopeful as the regional side prepares for next month's two test series. Stay with us. Sport is next. Come, sail with us through our ocean blues, where there's a blessed land that's waiting for you. Look, look, listen, listen, feel, feel. Realize your dream escape that's magically surreal. The best kept secret, a place you'll never forget, where adventure beckons with every gentle footstep. From lush mountain green to warm volcanic sand, submerged in splendor, our 32 enchanting islands. A kaleidoscope of experiences. No need to look anymore. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, the Caribbean you're looking for. Jamaican reggae star Tanya Stevens is set to release new music before the Christmas. Tanya shared the good news, the rhythm and buzz while on the island of Grenada recently. Songs will start being released from as early as Christmas, I think. Um, the first single should start, um, should touch the road by Christmas. And then I'm part of a collaboration of, of artists making a compilation, and that should, should hit the road. See, the thing about Tim is he's competitive. 
He's an athlete. He's a ball player. So if you're competitive, whether you're a woman, man, kid, whatever age, you just have that in your blood. That's why I hate golf so much. He's actually a good golfer. You've seen me golf, right? I'm not. That's why I don't even bother anymore. I just go fish the golf ponds. And I've made a career out of that, too. <laughs> well, it's pretty much been established that Tim and I, yeah, we're very competitive. We begin our sports segment with cricket. Captain Jason Holder says West Indies are under no illusions about the massive threat posed by the powerful New Zealand side. But he stressed that the Caribbean side will be looking to execute their game plan clinically in the two test series against the Black Caps starting next month. West Indies arrived in Christchurch, New Zealand on Tuesday to begin preparation for the rubber, which sees them chasing their first series win against that country in 22 years. And faced with a strong home side packed with the light of Kane Williamson, Ross, that's Ross Taylor and Trent Bolt, Holder said the Windies were very cognizant of the host's strength. Yeah, those guys, you know, bring a wealth of experience. You know, um, Kane has been one of the leading batsmen in Test for a while. Ross as well is um, similarly. So I think they will rely heavily on um, Ross and Kane. Obviously, Tom Nathan comes into the four as well. He's been doing pretty well for them. And obviously, they're born to be led by Bolton Southie. Um, you know, not missing out a guy like Neil Wagner. I think he brings a lot of quality to their side. Um, a lot of variation as well, being left handed and, and in different dimensions in terms of um, shorter pitch bowling. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good test. You know, they've got um, some good players and key players, and, and we've got the same. He said the challenge before his side in the upcoming series would be to continue the development which has been taking place. Asking the guys to, to remain focused on the process, you know, that's, that's all I, I zone in on, basically everybody knowing their role and executing. Um, I don't want to get too, too um, caught up with the conditions, obviously it plays a big factor, but you know, we've still got cricket to play and cricket is played on the field. Um, I think if we back our skills, uh, we prepare well, you know, we put ourselves in a very good um, um, place to win this test series. West Indies have become a settled squad in recent months with an unchanged unit from the England tour heading to Zimbabwe. Selectors made just one change for the current series, axing out of form Kyle Hope for prolific West Indies A right-hander Sunil Ambrose. They face New Zealand A in a three-day tour match starting Saturday in Lincoln before taking on the senior side in the opening test at the Basin Reserve in Wellington from December 1st to 5th and in the second test at Sedan Park in Hamilton from December 9th to 13th. Well, West Indies will have one less worry in the three-day tour match starting on Saturday after injured forced face, that's injured forced fast bowler Adam Milne is out of the New Zealand A squad. The 25-year-old has struggled with lower back stiffness throughout the week and selectors opted to withdraw him as a precaution. Milne has been replaced by veteran Wellington Seema Hamish Bennett for the contest set for the Burt uh, Sutcliffe Oval. He was expected to form part of an attacking pace trio for the tour game against the Windies, lining up alongside the likes of Scott and Logie Ferguson. New Zealand A had been struggling with, they had struck with previous misfortune as captain Martin Guptill and batsman Colin Munro were both ruled out of the squad on Wednesday because of injury and illness. Tom Latham was drafted in to skipper the side while James has come in for Munro. Switching sport now, Trinidad and Tobago's football head coach Dennis Lawrence has left the door open for retiring national forward Kenwin Jones to play a role in the Twin Island Republic's development program. Speaking to the Trinidad Guardian following Jones' shocking retirement, Lawrence said the 33-year-old has an abundance of experience that could be used to help develop the new generation of players. Lawrence said, and I quote, Kenwin has a unanimous amount of experience and it's something he can pass on to this generation. So as long as Kenwin is around and willing, he will always have a part to play with me because I think we cannot afford to let these types of people walk out of our football. End of quote. Jones played 89 times for TNT scoring 23 goals and was involved in the national team as recently as their failed qualifying campaign for next year's FIFA World Cup in Russia. Lawrence said it was this type of quality record that was hard to ignore. 
Over to action in the Barbados Independence Invitational Games, where Suriname's Leandro Dongo took on top honors in beach wrestling. Dongo defeated fellow Surinamese 3-2 in the final to become the beast of the beach grand championship. CBC's Damien Best was at Pirates Cove, where all the action went down and filed this report. Bulehu needing to stay alive in this one, forces Stewart out for the point. Then it was Stewart searching for that wrist control and Bulehu putting up resistance. After that, it turned into a straight up display of strength. Stewart getting the one point required and he would eventually finish third overall in that section. Second place went to Martin Joseph of Trinidad and Tobago. Here he is versus Rico Hurley of Barbados who's wearing the blue ankle support. Hurley going for the single leg takedown. Joseph trying to opt out. But Hurley awarded the two points with an improvised hip toss. However, Joseph would not go away quietly. Hurley gaining dominance with the body lock. Joseph counters and we're tied at two all. This one ended anticlimactic with a simple head snap. And Joseph of Trinidad and Tobago gets the one point needed smart rustling it ends 3-2 francois jones now of barbados would have his hands full against dongo leandro of suriname in red clear mismatch in height and weight leandro pushing his opponent around to collect back-to-back -back points is 2-0 number three coming up get out of town too much muscle Let's fast forward now to the grand champion final between Dongo and Vadesh Ramcharan, also of Suriname. Ramcharan reached this stage after finishing top of the under 80 kilogram section. Dongo, who was still feeling the effects of his final pool match against Martin Joseph, got a surprise from Ramcharan. Edge of the circle, hooks the leg and forced down, worth two points. Dongo will level at two all thanks to a lapse in concentration and some fatigue from round to round. Now with both men exhausted and time expiring in the period, 30 seconds of extra time was awarded to decide who would take home the top prize. Ram Turan in big trouble here, down for the count. That's victory to the 260 pound Leandro Dongo. 3-2, he is the big 2017 beast of the beach grand champion. And that's the sport. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Again, the major developments of this day. The International Monetary Fund warns Barbados will sink deeper into debt unless government makes further urgent spending cuts. And in sport, West Indies captain Jason Holder wary of powerful New Zealand but still hopeful as the regional side prepares for next month's two-test series. That's Caribbean Newsline. For news and sport around the clock, log on to carnanews.com. We'll be back here again tomorrow. But from all of us at CMC News, thank you for watching and do have yourselves a good night.